Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, right, I'll start. I'm Nick Rossiter, visiting fellow, Computing Science, Northumbria University. Um, computing Science indicates one or two things to me in this sort of area, that you're keen on implementations, so uh, anything I mention I hope can be implemented in Haskell, the functional programming language. So whereas 10 years ago, we were talking hot air, you could say, when we were talking about category theory. That's not the case now. It can be implemented in Haskell, most of the structures. So that's a great improvement. And we're also very economical in notation, computing scientists. We like to reuse things, so we don't like to define duplicate things, have redundancy and things like that. Well, knowledge went so I knowledge um, Mike Heather. Um, my partner for about um, 40 years, I think, in category theory research. And um, our work here builds on the Topos and the Monad. And we also did some work on time jitter, which is relevant to this. Because when you have um, orchestral performance, people aren't exactly in time. They might think they are, but there are slight time differences. And uh, these need to be handled. Um, but um, Mike's health's not so good. I went to see him in Exeter in December, and he had a. We discussed category theory, and he had a heart attack two days later. I hope not as a result of the category theory, uh, but he had a, a major operation. He's slowly recovering, so uh, let's um, hope that uh, he continues to. Um, Right, just uh, I, I, liked, I did have an abstract in for this, so I always copy the abstract into the start of the slides. So um, I, I've not always lived up to it, but um, Topos is something I use quite a lot. And um, the Topos comes from Aristotle, so it's a classical, category theory is very classical uh, in the, the way it's developed concepts. And Aristotle used it for legal arguments. So he'd have all his precedents and antecedents and things laid out in a, in a diagram. And uh, the logic of the diagram returned true or false. So if it was true, you were innocent, if that was the objective, or maybe guilty. So that's the original idea. So it's not just a straightforward structure. It's supposed to have a clear result. And the topos, as defined by Groff and Deke and others, is closed at both ends. That's a very important feature of the topos. So you, you don't have it open, it's closed. And a truth object or sub-object classifier may be more com complex than just true or false. Can be based on the natural numbers or even a partial order. But that's the important thing about the whole of the work presented today, that we're looking for objects that are up, that are closed. They have, a, they have a, a lower bound and they have an upper bound. That is, uh, that's a very important part of the sort of computing science we use. Yes, so at the lower end, you have products connected by times and the limit. And at the upper end, there are co-products. Co always means plus in category theory if it's uh, qualified as against something like So the product is times, the co-product is plus. So this is the plus side of the structure. So you imagine you've got a structure that the lower end is closed and its products, and the top end is closed by sums. The limit is the greatest lower bound in, uh, in classical set theory, and the co-limit is the least upper bound. Um, but their definitions are a bit more complex in category theory. And this interplay between times and plus plays an enormous role in information systems today, for instance, like relational databases, which was my, one of my original subjects I used to lecture in. Um, the times is the key of the structure, so it might be a supplier number or something like that. And the plus gives the further data on the supplier. So the times is the relationship, and, uh, and the plus is all the data that is associated with that relationship. And this is the Cartesian world upon which a lot of um, information science is based. So that's, um, I'm going to, it's not suitable for everything the Cartesian world, 
and we'll come to that later. So if you, if you don't have um, closure on your topos, it's not a classical topos. Existence of the co-limit, that's the top part, requires a single unique arrow from it to every object in the topos. And uh, that's an important requirement. If the arrow is not unique, then the co-limit is said to be weak and the structure is not a topos. So it's a very precise structure exploring this condition in our work and the co-limit is termed the initial object of the topos. So that's the structure that we have been dealing with routinely. And at last year's AMPA, we did quite a lot of exploration really of what was going on in uh, music in category theory. Things like players and scores. Well, this was one of the major criticisms I had last year when I did the work, was people said, where's the music? <laughs> and so uh, I modelled all the performers. It's a bit like some of these business consultants, you know, where you end up by doing everything except the actual core of the music, or the core of the problem, which is the, is the difficult bit. So that's actually one of the main objectives today, is to look at the actual musical uh, music scores and see how they translate into category theory or not. Um, so we had players and scores, and we had occasions representing a coordinated sound by the performers, but we do have a problem with this, and I'm going into this a bit today, in that it's never, in absolute time, it is not coordinated. There's always what you would term a bit of jitter associated with it. Uh, so, and I even covered administration of the concerts, but you'd expect a database person to do that. You'd want to get it administered properly. Um, last year, concentrated particularly on performance, and we were using the monad as the process representing movement from one timeline to another. So a timeline is a vertical slice of a score, and it was actually moving from one timeline to another. So basically, monad and topos are the, are the two structures we're using, which are very well developed in, in, uh, in uh, category theory, uh, not... We're not, we're not making up our own structures. That's one thing I would stress. If you want to develop your own structures, um, forget it. If you're a mathematician and you want to produce a new category, that might take you five, ten years. And then you could have it produced and marketed or whatever under your name. But if you just want to use something, you have to fit in with the, with the general flow. That's it. Yes, so one of the things we did last year um, uh, is this articulation and intonation. And this is, we've published this paper now, and uh, the monad RIA, that's a jointness between, um, between uh, intonation and articulation. And it's based on the junction articulation, intonation, eta and epsilon. Now a junction is a relationship between, you've got dual mapping, uh, you're going from the first timeline to the second timeline, and as you do that, you're going forward with A and back with I. If you imagine a violinist, when, they are, when a violinist is playing, you'll note they have the left hand, that is, uh, and they're using that for the for the actual holding the hand of the violin for selecting the right frequency on the strings. And the right hand, they are bowing. And so the right hand, we would consider to be articulation, because that, that is how you are making the noise. And the intonation is the actual string, uh, the hand fingers gripping the string to actually ensure you get the right frequency. Professional, professional violinists have actually they have fantastic skill in handling this because, as you know, the violin is not a discrete instrument. It is a continuous instrument, which is one of the problems I'm going to come with today. It's not, not like a piano. If you hit a note, you get that note. On a violin, you can be slightly off. And uh, I'm friendly with um, a professional violinist 
And she says that actually you have to have a very good ear for the music because as, you're, as the bow hits the string, you, your ear will sense whether you are spot on with the note or not. And your finger will instinctively move uh, up or down the string to actually alter the frequency to make it perfect. And the audience may not hear that, but uh, a, a lot of violinists do that. So intonation, which is really the accuracy of the, of the playing, well, it's about, of course, the bowing it, uh, has accuracy as well. If you're on the wrong string, <laughs> it, it, it will actually not be right. <laughs> but assume that, you're, assume that you're on the right string, that is, uh, selecting, selecting things like that. So, for this monad, which goes from one timeline to another, we represented articulation and intonation. Now, an example is clearest for the violin. Uh, the left hand goes into the right hand side of the brain. You probably know that. If you have anything, any body action, it's the opposite side of the brain it goes to. So the left hand goes into the right hand side of the brain, and the right hand goes into the left hand side of the brain. And so we actually we drew this in very crude brain structures. So bow, bowing by the right hand feeds in the left hand side of the brain and finger control by left hand feeding into the right hand side of the brain. Yes? Does this mean that left handed people would do better to reverse the instrument? But there, there aren't any left handed violinists. There wasn't a cartoon by Roll Sun. <laughs> well, okay, there may be a case for the one. But uh, I think uh, violin is only played by is always played the same way because if you imagine it, it would be very difficult if someone played uh, a different way. In an orchestra? Yeah. 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 And, and also you could argue that the violin is actually a left-handed instrument because the major skill is with the left hand, the fingering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when that left-handed violinist comes, they'll be the best. Sorry? So when that left-handed violinist comes, they will be the best. Yes, so yes. maybe. Yes, yes. So they actually have an advantage, left-handed people with the violin. Yes, sir. And, and sometimes it's quite mixed up. Like if you're playing the clarinet, of course, there's a big distinction between what you do with your mouth and what you do with your fingers. Yeah. But a lot of articulation and intonation is happening with the way the fingers are operating. That's exactly okay. right. Yes. And and of course, the example here is clearest for the violin. If you get something like a flute or uh, well, some of the, yeah. the instruments you blow. Uh, obviously the articulation is coming from the mouth, but how do you relate the fingers to that? They're often playing with both hands, so, like on a flute. Yeah, so, uh, so, yes, so we took the articulation as being the left-hand side of the brain and intonation the right-hand side of the brain for our violin. And in fact, with, with people, who learn a musical instrument when they're young, they have an enlarged corpus callosum uh, linking the two parts, two hemispheres of the brain because they, um, it, it puts a big load on, on, the, on the transmission. So if you want to get into, a, become a professional musician, I think you have to learn early to get your brain whilst it's plastic, uh, adapted a bit. So that was um, some of the work last year. In effect, we were running before we could walk because we hadn't done the musical score yet. So, <laughs> so uh, but that's the way things work. And we did publish it in um, Sociology and Anthropology and uh, we submitted a fuller version to AMPA 39, but that hasn't come out yet. <laughs> uh, so I won't say anything more about that. Yeah, I think that's one thing there. A composition of monads, yes, it's a composition going from one timeline to another. Musical, comp music, of course, composition is called composition. And it's exactly that. It is actually composing from one point to another. It doesn't make any sense, music, without the composing through the music. It's a bit like, I know when a child says, we'll play that again, and they say, I have to go back to the beginning. Uh, in professional orchestras, they don't do that. They'll say, I'll oh, start at bar 236. But um, there's still 
a lot of com the composition is there as a natural concept, really, for it. So, well, what are we going to do today? Um, well, we're going to look a bit more at the physical sounds, conditions for co-limits to exist, and the boundaries of their existence in the context of an actual performance. So we're going to look at the score and the players and what they produce and how it's all coordinated. Yeah, music genre. This gave me, this given me plenty of thought. <laughs> I, wish, I should have been doing this last year. <laughs> um, music is often viewed as discrete, and it is, of course. Although the frequencies are, you can think of as being continuous. Um, the way we've contrived to describe music, sheet music, is through keys, notes, name chords, as incorporated scores. It, it is discrete, uh, and uh, it is not continuous. But the physical sounds are waves with amplitude and frequency associated with a pitch in hertz. So um, it, it's a very physical um, occupation, but we do have this logical way to describe it which could almost have come from a database world, I sometimes think. It's such a, it's a very well-ordered thing to do. And chords have very complex physical properties, harmonics, particularly when overtones are considered. So um, the physics is actually very complicated. Simplest type of music, and the one which I'm going to really describe in first of all, is popular music. Um, generally no dissonance, you're not going to sell many copies if it's got Schoenberg type dissonance in it or something like that. And um, all notes within a particular key and a low range of pitch. So uh, this is the recipe for a popular song. Um, so that's really quite restrictive in the, in the demands it makes. Classical music though is really a lot more varied. and. Uh, uh, some people think, oh, it's very staid, whatever, but in fact, it's extremely complex and the way it's produced. Tonality, that's diatonic scale, well, strays readily outside that. You have what's called chromaticism, where composers, they write in a particular key, but they put in foreign notes which are not in the diatonic key. So you won't get someone like Beethoven restricting himself to writing everything in, C, in scale C when he's writing something in C major. And, of course, um, over the last um, 150 years, we've had the chromatic 12-note scale, just with 12 semitones across the octave. And uh, that doesn't have the recognised major chords, the keys and things like that. There's much dissonance. That's, uh, and when you get down to some individuals, Ligeti, for instance, every player has a different score. And Chopin, Rubato, he has a right hand playing at a different speed to the left hand, um, although it's not, it just puts rubato in the, as an instruction, but it's not actually uh, coded as such. So it's um, not so easy as people think. Jazz, improvisation, some written score, but much um, freedom of expression. And I think in between there, I'd like to add film music, Film music is actually quite a creative and, uh, and scholarly industry and uh, it's just drama with music and that obviously is another form that needs to be going. But this is the one that really makes life difficult and this is microtones. This is where uh, on a piano you can't have a microtone unless you do something to the tuning but on a violin you can play any note uh, and so Intervals less than a semitone are used for freedom, easier on string instruments and for music from diverse cultures and things like that. So um, microtones are a very different um, animal because they stop it being discrete. So uh, that is a problem. Well, I suppose well, the work I'm doing to start off with is suited to popular music. That's probably... Uh, <laughs> not the best of ambitions, but that's taking a simple, discrete approach. Um, but I'm going to look at the others and see what the implication is if you wanted to handle microtones. It can be readily adapted to the 12-note scale because that's still discrete. I, 
I did this was about three months ago. I was considering handling microtones and doing Stockholm's, Stockhausen's music. And as we'll see soon, that was an enormous step too far for, uh, <laughs> for a three month study. <laughs> uh, it just wasn't achievable. Because it requires a move from discrete to continuous maths, which is very interesting from the point of Ampere, because as we shall see, it starts bringing in physics structures which have words like abelian in them and uh, brings it perhaps a bit closer to um, the physics realm. Yeah, okay. So continuous mathematics is categories. What have we got here? Well, you've got real numbers, of course. You don't have C. Something might happen to be on C. We haven't got those. You've got vector spaces, um, tensor products. Cart Cartesian always ends up with a sum on the, on the plus side. In the tensor products, you don't get this. It's a tighter product. It preserves products throughout. And so um, tensor products is um, maybe more useful for some of the complex harmonics you get in, in the system. And there's this thing, the ring category, based on the abelian category, which has been developed. I'm not sure by Stockhausen, but it's mentioned in association with Stockhausen. And the work of Peter Fried becomes relevant here because his work is more equivalent to this continuous maths. I'm not doing that today, though. That's just because, uh, um, not surprisingly, Thoughts on the ring in progress because <laughs> there's no way that I could have done that in three months. It was uh, just ridiculous. So what I decided to do was the work I was already building up was on the score. So we'll have a look now at some um, category theory. Oh yes, sorry, I've got to do this. Mike Heather wanted me to put this in. Uh, Mike Heather's a very keen fan of now. Oh, sorry, Whitehead. Yeah. Alfred North Whitehead. A philosopher and he said the now is very relevant to to your work here um, now is what happens at a particular instance but as Whitehead points out you can have lots of local nows which you need to synchronize to build up one big now if you like actually handling an event and I think this is it's not that well specified here but um, this is one of the problems that we have, that we have lots of local nows and no orchestra will ever play in complete time. And so um, it, it is a problem which uh, I'm going to deal with a bit, I'm going to bring in a jointness later. So the overall aim, yeah, I hope it's going to advance our understanding music in universal terms and better understanding the formation of co-limits, yes, trying to close all this off at the top. But this is important, music of course, why are we doing it? Well, when I did databases, um, you didn't want expressiveness. Nobody wants their bank account to be created, to be treated creatively. I do. <laughs> you know, when it is normally treated creatively, you find one pound twenty-five has been taken out, <laughs> and it slowly disappears through their, their creative accounting. But people expect in the database world transactions to be absolutely spot on. They have to be accurate. Whereas in music, if you go to a musical performance. And uh, they say, well, that was played exactly as in the score. They will say, not very good, was it? A bit wooden. Uh, not very interesting. And so in music, you're actually going to an area which is more expressive. And of course, in human communication, that's the same thing. You, you do talk with expression. And so that's really, it's not just about music. It's about the contrast with databases and communication. Right, well, I always have pullbacks in my... Um, Right. So I'm going to build up some musical notation. Uh, so these are notes like C, D, E, F, G, something like that. Octave, they're normally numbered from 0 to 7, something like that. And then I've got a pitch associated with that. So, in effect, if, if this is C, 
and that is 4, then this will intersect here on the pitch of 261.626 hertz. So something is, exists in this pullback if that composed with that equals that composed with that. And uh, so it's composition, as always in category theory. And this you can think of as the intersection of note and octave. What does octave equals four mean? Sorry? What does octave equals four Oh, mean? octave, they number things like C4 is middle C. So C3 is an octave below. So three okay. would be the octave below on the... Half the frequency. Oh, the octave below C. Well, is four is the middle of the piano. Because the piano is a keyboard. Oh, I see. Oh, right. Oh, so it's one, yeah. two, three, four. Yeah, four is the middle of the piano. Right. Three would be to your left, so one, one once. One, one, seven, yeah, two, two, that's two, right. Seven, three, one, seven, so that's start to C0. Mm -hmm. and then go yes, that's right. You go right down to C0 to C and up to C7. To C C C C so, um, so this is, in effect, typing notes in this pullback PB6. C and for the C major scale. But you don't have to type it that way. That, that I have chosen to type it that way. And moving on from this, I can make sure that any note that somebody puts in will be in this key. So that's setting up a nice popular song in C major. Chords are a bit more complicated because, of course, you've got single notes, you've also got chords. So what I've done there, this is typed as the par object of the, of the, the notes, so it's all possible combinations of the notes. And the chords can also just contain one note, which I know raised the hackles of one or two musicians, but it's really a combination of notes, chord. So it's based on the par object there. And the type would be things like the major chord, which is the root, the major third, and the perfect fifth. Uh, so you could pick out chords, which again would restrict the harmonics that you could get. But this is all optional. You could actually, uh, if you get rid of this typing, you can play any note you like. And that's basically the idea. So that's giving rise to chords which are very important. And then you also need to accent the chords with things like staccato. Could also be the amplitude, the, the strength of the note. And this is one way you can make the typing easy. This is a universal object. If this is a universal object, then this is just the Cartesian product. There's no restriction. So the other two note diagrams were restricting it, whereas this one is not. And you could have had all of them with universal objects. That, that just means you're, you're not restricting anything at all in the, in the notes you've got available. So these are all permissible. I haven't actually done any composing yet. All I've done is setting up the types of the notes that you can put in. So up there, permissible chords and accents. You note I'm reusing the previous pullback in this one. Um, my, one or two mathematicians might raise their eyebrows at that, but it's, uh, this is just... Uh, a Cartesian closed category embedded at that point. And from a um, computing point of view, we like this sort of structure where you can build things up from the basics. Because I could use PB6 in um, something else. Another thing I should add is perhaps why don't why aren't I aren't starting at PB1? Well, that's last year's paper. Well, I don't want, I've still got those as PB1 to PB5. <laughs> so the, you might have, I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so this is the, um, just the Cartesian product. If you have something in here, then it restricts the Cartesian product to, to that context. So that is the um, basic idea. Right, so now let's get a bit closer to the actual plane. Um, if we take that last one, all the, um, all the permissible notes, then we can assign them to an instrument. Because, you know, if you have a score, you have things like violins, clarinets, and things like that. So 
this would assign a set of a collection of permissible notes for one timeline in the musical score. So this would be for one instrument, one note they're going to play. So for a flute it might be F, something like that. On a piano it could be a chord, something like that. So this is getting much closer now to we're actually going to play something. Because uh, PV8 is the available notes uh, and that's an instrument and that is a particular chunk of the score. Okay. Yes, so a timeline could be a bar, it could be an offset to a bar if you've got two, two um, musical notes per bar, then you'd have uh, an offset halfway through. Right, so that gives the timeline and the instrument. This is, looks a similar diagram, but it's actually subtly different. I've now brought in the player, and I've also renamed this occasion. Occasion is another whitehead word, uh, it really means an event, something like that, timed event, something like that. But if you look at the previous one, that was what we call intentional. It didn't have any details specified of who was going to play the instrument or of the actual sound produced. It was just, just the recipe for the sound. Here we've gone to an actual player being assigned and this is an actual sound that's being produced. So this is a well-known relationship. Um, sorry. This is a well-known relationship. This is a definition this is, in, this is what we call intentional, so it is uh, a definition of a bit of a musical score without any specifics, not how it's played. The next one actually shows how it's played, because you've got a player in and we've actually got some sound. And so this is a very, very common intention-extension relationship applies in databases a lot, but intention is the definition of the type and the extension is the instance of, of that performance. Yes, so I've, ch I've changed the labels, but we've, uh, we've changed to actually get, so that's actually some played music there, uh, whereas all the others are uh, just theory. It's uh, basically it. quite complex when you get up here, when you're thinking of something like a symphony orchestra. Um, there are many occasions for each performance of a timeline, one for each instrument. So we've really got a canonical case here for the occasion. As if you imagine a typical orchestra has got 40 members, or 80 more, uh, that means that you've got actually many occasions in each timeline. Uh, you might have 80 people playing. So you've got one definition, which is that, and when you actually, even for that, when you go down the, um, the score, filling in each instrument, so you've got each player there as an instance, you're going to have something like 80 of those in a full symphony orchestra for the one intention. And that is actually quite a lot to handle. So who gets paid for handling that? Well, we'll come to that later. It's a uh, it's very important person. Yes. <laughs> I think when you, when you see it put out in category theory terms, you can see how much the conductors are <laughs> there. And uh, stripes, really. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so let's um, take this a little bit further. Right, so if the players are perfect, and like Berlin Philharmonic with Herbert von Karajan, always supposed to be brilliant and sharp, that, um, that would mean that time-wise there was virtually no jitter anyway. But they probably weren't hitting the notes absolutely right. I mean, a violinist is not going to hit the notes absolutely right because 
um, because it's uh, they're on a continuous instrument. Uh, uh, piano, pianists might, but there might still be differences. I don't think actually that's a bit of a joke with the Berlin Phil. Would, I think they, he would have wanted some expression in it. And of course, this is another thing that the conductors do try and build expression into performances. And expression is achieved by f uh, having phrases, so the music uh, does, is uh, held together over a phrase before you start another phrase. And, uh, and also through perhaps varying the, the amplitude a bit, saying play this a bit louder or play this a bit slower in the build-up to something. So expression here is not a bad thing at all. Uh, so, so, so strictly the values for the extension should be in accordance with the rules of the intention. If you were doing a more uh, staid application that would be the case. But there is a type issue I think with this diagram and I want to take this further. We've got the intention there with the timeline, but that's not a sound, that's just text. That's just text on the score. And, uh, but these days you could generate a, a sound associated with that. You can, you can press flute on some electronic devices and it'll play a piece of music in flute mode. And so there's no reason why you shouldn't actually have some notional, anyway, um, ideal note that is produced. Uh, from the intention. So what I've called this is timeline sound. So really we should be comparing occasion, which is what the players play, with timeline sound, which is the theoretical uh, uh, timeline as it ideally is played. So timeline sound is the anticipated sound produced from the score, and occasion is the actual sound actually produced by a player. But if we do this, we can actually produce functors to compare these two. So we can have a functor F, which takes the occasion to timeline sound, and a functor G, which takes timeline sound back to occasion. And what I'm building up here is in a joint structure. We can then look for a jointness GF with unit co-unit eta and epsilon for offsets in the mapping. So we're not expecting these to be perfect, these mappings, because as you go across there will be slight differences perhaps in pitch and there might be slight differences in, um, in the timing, the jitter, but I've bundled those into one for the moment because it's quite complex actually trying to separate them. So we have a familiar jointness diagram like this. So this is the uh, occasion going across to the timeline sound and you can imagine going over to here, not coming exactly where you should, and then you come back to here and you're a bit out as well. So um, this is represented by the unit. This actually will represent uh, the, uh, an arrow here with an arrow here after it's gone across and back. It's a displacement. And the same from this side. The code unit measures an arrow as it gets taken over there and then back again. So it's measuring the uh, displacement. If the performance is perfect, these triangles collapse. There's no triangles because they are perfectly in sync. It wouldn't be a joint. It would be isomorphic. So a jointness is a, is a lesser condition than isomorphism. Isomorphism means uh, a complete uh, faithful mapping backwards and forwards. So. Uh, but I think that will be very rare. Okay, so that's the sort of a jointness that we, we might pick up, and which the conductor is struggling to... Well, he may have initiated some of it. I mean, if the conductor said, might actually say, I want this, I want the style, I don't want it played as it's in the score, I want it, I want you to drag that note or to do whatever, in which case, so some of this is conductor initiated, giving style, and some of it is, um, I won't call it sloppiness, but uh, you know, it'd be imprecision, slight, slight imperfection in the performance. Yeah? There's a notion of a perfect performance that sits behind this, is there? 
No, I'm really saying no. I'm really giving the notion of an imperfect performance. Uh, so if there was a perfect performance, this is defined here because these triangles <coughs> would collapse. It'd be, it would be absolutely faithful, the mapping as expected, between the occasion, the sound produced by the orchestra, and the theoretical um, production. So the assumption with this is that it will not be perfect. It might be better than perfect, of course, you know, so if you know what I mean. But, but there are so many... Can I, I, can I, I've got a thing here. Can I, can I ask a musical question? Yes. Musically. <coughs> Alright, so what's the difference between this? And this? Sound very similar to the... There is a there is a there is a there is a how would it be described here? And is the description I think it would be in the D seven maybe? There's that uh You mean the wavering? The, sorry. Sorry? What what was the difference? The wavering. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well in that case if you did a comparison of the physical ideal plane and the um, and the um, how the orchestra how that orchestral member played it, mm. you would have a difference here okay. uh, uh, on the adjunction. Sound yeah. 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 Y
they communicate a bit earlier with the singers to indicate that they We're need... curious about like the, the person who says the first violinist, the, the principal violinist, or for instance, like in a string quartet, there are certain gestural or sonic cues that people have like a... Like, yeah. You know, they would do that to sort of get a, yes. a sort of synchronicity in mm. some way, but mm. I don't know if that's factored. That no, it, I think this is one thing that uh, I'm... Or if it's purely sonic or... Yes, yes, because there, there, there are these two dimensions to it not quite matching and uh, this one again is um, it, it, you've got artistic effect mixed up with everything so uh, not, none of this is wrong it's, uh, it's just uh, right so what's this oh yes this is one this final diagram I think really um, PB10 um, so one of the good things about um, intention extension relations is that they give co limits. Generally, when you define a pullback, it does not have a, a, a co limit. It has a limit on the time side. But the plus side is still, although you have co products, it's still open. But if you have this type of diagram, which is a Doolittle diagram, uh, which provides intention extension relationship, that's the intention and that's the extension, the occasion. And in that case, you can, I've now drawn a co-limit on here, and that co-limit is going to form the top of the topos. So that, that is, uh, uh, it may need a bit, I, I, there needs a bit more work done on this because it's all canonical cases. And uh, uh, obviously you can just be extravagant and put in a few extravagant brackets and have dot 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 but I don't think that's very categorial or very very elegant so there will have to be some work done to uh, to get the to get the canonical case sorted yes so when the pullback is a do little diagram and this sort of diagram there's a set valued front from there to there giving the extension so so that's uh, a good place to have at the top. And I think P P10 is the conductor or maestro or whoever your leader is. As you say, in a string quartet, there could, there, there's still a leader, in effect, somebody who's driving the, the thing. And obviously they have a lot of responsibility here when you think of it. When they've got something like 40 to 80 members of the orchestra <laughs> All, they've got to keep them all in time, but some of them are more critical than others at certain moments. I mean, obviously, if you get a flute part, which is actually going to stand out, they're what's called exposed, uh, the conductor's going to have to pay special attention to, to that part. And so the conductor has quite a balancing act to, um, to see what is realised compared to the ideal sound. And also, is this what is realised value-added? Is it improving the performance, or is it making it appear sloppy, and uh, <laughs> and uh, something like that? So, that, so there may be style or performance reasons for differences. So the conductor, quite rightly, is in a very important part as the initial object of the performance, and that's why that's why they get such prominence in programmes because the conductor really does uh, control the players and is responsible for good performance generally. So, so it's good to capture that. Right, how are we doing? Yeah. So, music is proving to be a fertile area for the um, application of category theory. It takes you far beyond things like information systems, which are, I don't want to say boring really, but they're a lot more... It's not, it's not boring. <laughs> boring. <laughs> Uh, top off structure for discrete scales is verified. The co limit is the sound from the time scale, and individual adjointness for each player's performance can be represented. But I think the next stage, the handling of music with continuous maths, is a major challenge. And uh, I think, um, but potentially very rewarding, because I think that is actually going to lead into categories which are a lot closer to the physics world.
<laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah. but I'm doing the work bringing us closer together <laughs> uh, okay well, I'd like to finish that thank you very much There's uh, another area of temporal networks that may be very closely related to this. Yes. And that is studying asynchronous uh, networks, possibly digital, uh, if you know yes. what I mean, where the final results are independent of small time variations inside the network That's because of the good, design good. of the network. Yeah. And in some sense, the design of a musical performance is. Yes, yes, yes. I, it must be elsewhere in, in things like networks, yes, because you have to tolerance, isn't it, really? So we need to build in what's susceptible tolerance, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious then, there, for me the talk uh, covers two big things. Like, uh, one is just trying to categorify musical performance mm -hmm. and looking at one uh, particular genre or sub subcategory of genre. But uh, another is this the asynchronicity thing, which is kind of interesting. That, yeah. That, um, and I was thinking in our in the laws of form uh, conference that we had before, there was a, a talk that spoke about chanting, and how oh. chanting is a very focused. Seemed to be a very chanting, focused. You have to be. In you have time, to be in unison in in, uh, in every sense of the word. Yes. In unison, whether it's in spirit or pitch or breath or. Uh, yes. And, and so it seems to be, uh, I was thinking about that uh, in terms of like, sure, there could still be, a, it still is asynchronous to a certain degree, but then we would like to believe that we're together. Yes, in, that's in right. Same, when, same when you make it so close that it becomes perceived to be synchronous. And I'm curious what, about... Uh, what was the name of the speaker? Fred. 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 But you could also do harmonies in yeah. this, with temporal and no difference. Yeah, yes, that, well, that, well, that's an extreme case for chanting, but uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And I think one of the key questions that relates to that is how does music communicate? Because there's no. Yeah. yeah. yeah this, we keep coming back to this. So you can do. You can, you can do all sorts of things, but people kind of get it. There's, there's yes. something that we get. Mm. What is it? How does that work? Well, it's very interesting, yes. And it's these low uh, frequency ratios which uh, have low integers are pleasing. Is that right? Like 2, uh, two, uh, two to 1 and oh, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, but then you have, you'd have to generalise the psychology of everybody who hears music. Mm -hmm. and, but we seem to live in a world where it's not just even human beings that engage in something like music. Like no, no, like birds. birds. Do it, whales do it. Yeah, everybody. that's right. It's, it's yeah. There's a song about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, there is a body of work, um, mostly in Edinburgh, um, people looking at communi communicative musicality. Mm. I think I mentioned this last year. Actually. Yes. Um, yes. And but this this question is not so much what music is. It's it's what is it do with each other, but somehow we seem to feel the same thing. It's, it's like, well, it's, it's the closest thing is sex. Mm. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, how does that work? Oh, not sex, music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something without a pattern that, that nevertheless has a sort of identity has in a time. Yeah, there's, there's no sort of uh, linear relation between what makes good music you can analyze. Yeah. And there are different tastes, aren't there? I mean, like a Shostakovich string quartet, for instance, but might be magic to somebody and would turn someone else off completely. They have a, a few of the, I'm not sure if people are aware of the ethnomusicology or, or musical anthropology, which is a field now that sort of studies music as mm -hmm. a very broad semiotic sort of way of yeah. using Charles Sanders' purse and signs and stuff. But I'm, I'm wondering, like, this idea of whether you go from culture to culture, this idea of sameness, this idea of isomorphism, this idea of, like, octave or unison is really interesting. Like, if yes. You, that, that if you hear something and then you're like, oh, I just heard the same thing, this notion of sameness, mm -hmm. I think is, is, is very, somehow there's something there in, in it, uh, which, which doesn't seem as broad as a huge, uh, you know, 
big orchestra or, or like a, a, that would seem like a much more complicated and broad, especially mm. varying from uh, time period to time period, yes. and tradition to tradition. I think uh, these different cultures, I think, to some, some of them probably are discrete. You know, right. But that people have lumped them with making them continuous because they don't fit nicely into our scales. But right. if they're discrete, they can still be handled by the same way as the discrete maps here. You just define different notes. Yeah, and, and like with Hindustani classical yes. or, or uh, um, Indian music, like Is that you discrete? Have like, no, but you'd have a, a tanpura, like this big. Uh, instrument that, which is just a constant drone that's happening in the background. Oh, yes. Right? So which is, so. And then actually in uh, jazz, modal jazz, there, there, there are certain modes and frameworks that are droney in a way and I'm wondering that uh, it's more like a push and pull in between coming back into this center or this one unison sort of idea. I don't know, I, I don't want to go too far out. <laughs> yeah, so, but but yeah. You could say there was a center. Right? A sense to this, and that center goes out through music, it goes through the kind of vibrations, the way that molecules form, yeah. the symmetries you have in molecules, mm -hmm. and the vibrational symmetries that happen. They're also similar. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to planetary systems. If you look at the way planetary systems form, they're forming in a resonance harmony kind of way. Where the planets are, it's very interesting in terms of their relationship of motions with each Stability. other. Stability. Again, it could be made into sound, and can be made into sounds which you can listen to. So, so you have the central thing, which is, which is almost the physics, we're talking about the physics of harmony in terms of going up a fifth or down a fourth or whatever, which is, and, and, which is pleasing to birds and humans and all the other things that were mentioned in that song. And those things are there and central, but then what's very often interesting is the difference. When you take that, you have the octave, you split it into 12, you split it into, and when you hear some of these things into 19, for example, although the harmonies are then better in 19 because they're a bit better going up and down, first time you hear it, it sounds like music from aliens. It's so different. Mm -hmm. It's different to anything you've heard before. You mentioned Hindustani as well. And for me, coming into Indian music, coming into African music, and some of the rhythms in African music, every single one of these is an utter shock. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, my God, and then a whole opening up of new things that come from those alien at first, but then so Still, like the fonts that Andrew was talking about in a way, like yeah. the those are beauty of things. Yeah. They are, in some sense, self-forming, <laughs> and uh, and that centrality is very interesting. So in Scotland as well, we have pentatonic plus a drone in the background. It's just God, that gets you marching. That's just <laughs> <laughs> but, but what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm curious about is that it can get really complicated if if we try to unify all cultures with some sort oh, of notion of like why? pleasure and <laughs> disappointment or something. But, yeah, but I, I feel like unison is something that yeah. is weird. And unison? And unison, or As like this notion of sameness, but, but that we same. hear the same thing. You don't hear it. Or, or we think of it as a, where, where it's sort of like... No, what, what you hear is something that's a combination between what has been played and how you interpret it. So, and, and what you hear is what you interpret. It's the second world. It's not the it's not the first world where it's come from. So you always hear what you hear and not what is played. Mm -hmm. But in so, Goethe, the whole point is uh, not to analyze uh, the music, but to, to see that the pattern is in the music already, yes. and that um, if you analyze it, you're taking away from that pattern. That well, I've always heard. Yes. Mm. I, I mean, there's this business about category. Why, why do we create categories in the first place? Mm. Um, because, for, you know, categories in a sense, so, you know, they're mops for uncertainty. You know, you're, you're not sure about something, so you create a category, but you're, you're <laughs> going to put it in this box. Everything you don't know goes in this box. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got a big box. Wow. Um, but the boxes, the boxes cause problems for us. Yes. You oh. can handle errors in it. Well, not errors. You can handle variations. Well, there is something else. It's being exposed to something that we don't know and we get used to it. Once we start maybe to understand some cultural background that goes back to this Andro thing. Uh, my personal experience is with Japan. When I first heard the traditional Japanese music, it was completely alien to me. But I lived in Japan for all and off maybe close to two years. And after that, it was something which I almost felt in my bones, yes? Because I was exposed to it, I was exposed to culture. And so you just, uh, through osmosis, you, you become familiar with it. 
And the same with African music. Maybe this goes back to our origin as humankind in, in Africa. That when you open up, you can, you can get this. It's pure speculation. The thing about the word category is we, we tend to think of it as like a concept or something. But, but category theory is actually about relationship and process. It's mathematics which is directly about relationship and process. Arrows are composable. Um, the relationships among things are prior to whatever they might be composed of. And so it's a very natural kind of language to apply to something uh, temporal. Yeah. So there's a difference between something being categorical and the category theory and category, or the category and category theory. Category yeah, category. yeah. Or, Right. I mean, the word gets used in different ways. Yes. And, I think it's and, and there is a sense yes. of making something unique in one way or another. Like uh, a limit object is, has a certain uniqueness property that yeah. defines it. It's categorical in that sense. Mm -hmm. But the key idea that you have objects and arrows and that you can move along arrows to get from one place to another, graph theoretic idea would be. But the idea of compositionality, compositionality in that sense. So is this an arrow? Is that, sure. That's an arrow. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There'll be a composition of arrows. And it's much more <laughs> it's much <laughs> more than a it's sense. not a function. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 Mathematics yes. have the idea that the arrows are all functions, but functions are always this is kind of predetermined there's a rule and it tells you how to get it from here to yeah. there. Yeah. But an error is just some way of getting from here to yeah. there. So if I did... That's composition. That's, that's, that's what? Composition. That's composition. Yeah. So that's... Also the, that, the, the, the second one, just one note you're playing, isn't it? Yeah. If you're playing... Yeah, just slide. Yeah, if you're playing several notes, you're composing them. If you make something and we can't, and you can't figure out how to reduce it to other things, Make it into a composition of things, then we call it a basic arrow. Okay. You call it a what, sir? A basic, basic arrow. Basic. A basic move, right. I don't know how to decompose a note that I blow on the clarinet into some smaller thing. It's just the note I blow. But then you would say that that note is composed of overtones and that it's yes, also, you know, so you can, yeah, go, so you can double click sure. into that arrow yeah. and get more yeah. arrows. Yeah. Double click into it. <laughs> like the language is changing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think that, that your basic question about the effect of music is going into this, yeah, this, the, the mathematics of the mind. Mm. Um, because it's, you know, where does music begin? Where does, our spoke, where, where does spoken language end and music begin? All those things, but where, where, where is it? Where is it sound? Where is it music? Mm -hmm. that's, noise. That, that's, 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 to, that's to do with our human spirit, you know, to do with mind. This is, you know, n not reducible to um, just, the interesting thing is that music is I think, I think Nicky should sit next to Mark at dinner tonight. We've <laughs> 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 got the whole evening to discuss the universal language and all that sort of stuff. Well, thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no chat. I'm actually much more interested in the music than the music. Yes, I think so. Yes.